If you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading, uh, revisiting a little bit from last week. We're going to be going to John chapter 14. I'm thankful for what Ralph shared a little bit about, you know, going out, having mercy and not sacrifice. And uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, Last week we were talking about the Holy Spirit and how desperate we are for the Holy Spirit. As believers, we, we need the Holy Ghost. We can't do it on our own. And I was thinking in, in a week, now, when we come to church on Sunday morning, we're here for maybe two hours. Oh, one more thing before I forget, because I always forget things. Right after church, we're going to have a little reception downstairs with some coffee and cake for R Ralph and Ann. So everybody's invited to come down and, uh, and enjoy that, okay? Uh, that'll be right after church. Okay, now, all right, back to the Word. When you get old like me and those things pop up, you've got to say them while you're thinking about them or you'll forget them. All right. How, how many people, how many hours are in a week? Do your math real quick. 24 times 7. 168 hours, 168 hours in a week, 24 hours a day, times seven, right? Now this is, they did a survey. This is an average, you know, these are averages. These might not apply to you personally, but the average person spends about 53 hours sleeping. Some of us spend a little more than that. <laughs> Most of us, some of us get it when we're in church. You know, okay. <laughs> the, average, the average person that took this survey uh, 60 hours at work. For those of some of us don't work, some of us are retired, don't work, but on the average, spend 60 hours work, some spend more, some spend less. 18.2 hours of leisure time, just like hanging out, playing solitaire on a computer, okay. 7.7 uh, .7 hours household activities. That means you know, cleaning, cutting grass. My wife would say mine's a lot less than that, but, you know, okay, that's like stuff around the house, all right. 7.7, .7, eating and drinking, and I'm not going to make any wisecracks about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, 8.4, caring for others, children, you know, maybe if you're a caregiver, okay. And 12.6 hours, other, okay, other. The so I was thinking, you know, when we come, most of us, many of us, will come to church on a Sunday morning and spend about two, maybe three hours at church wherever you go to church. Some of you come Sunday night and Wednesday night. That's a few more hours. But out of 168 hours, we spend maybe maximum four or five hours in church. Maybe you come to men's meeting. Maybe you come to the ladies' meeting or whatever it might be. But why is it important for us? And some people will say, and we've all heard this. Maybe some of us have said this. I don't got to go to church. I can worship God at home. I can turn the TV on and watch Jim, you know, Jimmy Swagger or something. I can, I can do whatever. Yeah, I don't got to go. But why is it important to come here or to wherever your church is, a congregation? It doesn't have to be just this building. But wherever, where, why, is it, why did the Bible say, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together? Because when we come together, this is the filling station for the rest of the week. Your three, two or three hours or four or five hours is, is what you need provided the Spirit shows up. What you need for the rest of the week, because when you get out there, how many people know out there it's a hostile environment toward the gospel? Out there tries to make you live like different than what the Bible says you ought to live. We, we, we are, uh, the world tries to transform us, or tries to conform us to its image. It says in Romans, uh, you know, be not conformed to the world. The world tries to press us into its mold, and so I have to say, a lot of times we let it, we give it the tools, we say, here, you know, here I am, mold me and shape me, all right? But the Word says that God wants to transform us or change us. So this is like a filling station. And we started last week talking about the Holy Spirit and how important the Spirit is in the life of the believer. And uh, I, there's no better treatise on the Holy Spirit in all of the Scripture and in John chapter 14, if you have your Bibles, will you turn there with me? We all know that this passage of Scripture, when Jesus was speaking these words, it was on the night before his crucifixion. And 
He was preparing his disciples for what was to come. And we know, we know the story, we know what happened. But his disciples that were with him at that Passover dinner, they had no clue. They didn't know what was coming. They, they were thinking kingdom and he was going to be the king and the, sit on the throne of David and so forth. But they didn't know what was coming the next day. He tried to tell them, but they didn't listen. You ever have somebody you tried to tell something and didn't listen? Parents? Okay. You try to tell your kids something and they, don't, they say, yeah, yeah. And they, and they figure they know more than you. Well, the disciples figured they had Jesus figured out, but they didn't understand. And he told them, he was equipping them. He said, I'm going away. That's a sad thing to hear from somebody. I'm leaving. I'm going. And they were like, where are you going? What, that, that was a shock to them because they were expecting him to be, they were fighting over who was going to be second in command. But he said, I'm leaving. They said, you're leaving. Listen to what he said. A passage that is dear, near and dear to so many hearts in chapter 14. <laughs> he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's saying, listen, what I'm telling you, now you, you, need to, you need to believe what I'm telling you. You need not to doubt what I'm saying. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus said, listen, I'm leaving but I'm going away so I can prepare a place that you can come and be with me. Now again, they weren't thinking about somewhere else. They wanted the king in Jerusalem, the Messiah. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, and this is when I, and I said this before for those of you who were here and I showed the pictures when I went to, to Anne's and Ralph's church in Germany, I felt right at home in that church because when I walked in on the back wall, they had in German, and I, I, I don't read German, but I saw the scripture reference, and it said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They had this verse on the back of their, on the back of their sanctuary, or on the front of their sanctuary. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Jesus says, you know the father, you've seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the father. Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? You see, all this, we said last week that these disciples, he had been teaching them for three and a half years, even after the resurrection, he taught them for 40 days before he ascended up into heaven, and they still really didn't get it until they got the Holy Spirit. After they got the Holy Spirit, they didn't have to take a refresher course, they didn't have to go to graduate school. Okay? It says, Verse 10, and I'm, I'm reading down to where I want to get. This is just like introductory. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Whoa! Jesus did some pretty great stuff. He healed people. He cast out devils. He raised people from the dead. How, how greater can you get than that? See, I, I don't believe he was talking about greater in the kind of gift because raising people from the dead, there's really not a whole lot greater you can do that. I believe he's talking about in magnitude because Jesus was only one guy in one place at a time when he took on flesh. And he traveled from one town to another to another, and his disciples with him. And he sent his disciples out one time, two by two, and they went out, and so forth. But what Jesus is saying, he's saying, listen, the works that I've done, because I'm going to the Father, you guys are going to be able to do so much more. He says, in verse 13, now listen to this. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, See, people will take this verse out of context and they'll start asking for all kinds of big cars and houses and money and gold and everything else and make a whole doctrine, make whole, 
whole denominations out. But it had nothing to do with stuff. It has nothing to do with our personal, you know, uh, possessions. It has nothing to do with our personal fame and fortune. This all has everything to do with God's purpose for our lives as witnesses. He says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the, why? That the Father may be glorified. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now listen, we can ask Jesus for things. Don't get me wrong. We can ask him for Ralph Sheridan. He, he was praying for a wife. And we pray for things. And God can answer those prayers. But this promise about whatever we ask in his name doesn't necessarily apply to everything we ask for. It's talking about the stuff that we do for him. The stuff that will glorify the Father. The stuff that will give glory to God. See, if your purpose, if your reason for asking for something is to give glory to God, then that, that can fall under this. But if you just want a nicer car, well, you know, you can ask for one. And I hope you give glory to God if you get one. Okay, listen to what he says. Now he goes on, and I'm, I'm reading in, up to this. If you shall ask anything in my name, in my name, I will do it. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you what? Another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, Jesus is going to begin to give a treatise on the Holy Spirit. We touched on it last week. Why, did we, why, why do we receive the Holy Spirit? Why do we pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Listen to what he says about the Holy Spirit. He says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, how long? Forever. Jesus was going away, but the Spirit never goes away. Jesus was going to sit at the right hand of the Father, but he's given the Spirit, so it would be with us forever. Forever. He says, even the Spirit of what? Truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and shall be in you. We, we need to be careful about what we ascribe to the Holy Spirit. It's quiet. We need to be careful because, listen, the Holy Spirit didn't come to make us feel warm and fuzzy. Now, that can, that can happen. It's good. You ever sense the presence of the Spirit and you get like, you know, and you feel His presence? And you, you ever get goosebumps? You know, for the Holy Spirit's going. That's good. That's a good thing. But He was given not to make us feel good, but He was given to lead us into all truth. Sometimes the truth doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes the truth is painful, sometimes it hurts. He says, I will not leave you comfortless, verse 18, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. And that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments, that keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, I want to ask you, do you love him this morning? Do you love him this morning? You might know him. You might like him. You might appreciate him. You might consent that, yes, Jesus. Jesus is God, yes. But do you love him? He says, if a man love me, he will what? Keep my word. See, I, there's all kinds of people that say they, they love in Jesus, but they ain't keeping his words. See, I could tell my wife I love her, but if she don't see me but once a week, <laughs> yeah. see, see, see love you know, it's easy to say love but proving it showing it where the rubber meets the road so I said last week when we, had, when we took communion I said you better make sure you love Jesus 
you better make sure you're not just going through the motions. Because if you just go through the motions, and you can do the church thing, and you can put it on, and you can do all, all that on the outside. Man, listen, this, the time is coming in this world right now that if you're not serious about this, you're going to get chewed up. He that loves me, if a man love me, verse 23, he will keep my words, my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you, yet being present with you. Verse 26, but the Comforter, here we go with the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Paraclete, that's what that word means, somebody who will come alongside you and help you, Paraclete, beside help which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall what? Teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You see, when you listen to somebody stand behind the pulpit, preaching God's word, maybe that's the word that, you know, you're hearing my voice, but I hope and pray that the word that I'm reading and I'm speaking is not my word, but it's his word. I don't want to give you my opinion. Now, you don't want to hear my opinion. <laughs> I don't want to give you my opinion. I want to give you God's word. Because that's, you know what, my opinion is, isn't going to do a thing for you. What I think is not going to do a thing for you. But God's word, his anointed word, will make you the people he needs you to be. He says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. If you're in the darkest, deepest dungeon, God will bring to your remembrance. And as many of us have been in low places in our lives when it seemed like everything was falling apart. God will bring, when in those times that everybody has turned against you, God will bring to your remembrance a promise, a word, a song, a song, an encouragement. He'll bring that to you. He'll remind you of the great things he's done for you and for your people and for his people. He'll remind you of the great things, the great works he has done in his word. Because you're no different than anybody else. I'm no different than anybody else. He's been doing this for centuries, for millennia. Listen to what he says. Verse 27. This is, the, this is the Holy This is why we need the Holy Ghost. Peace. I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, let not your heart be troubled. How many people here need peace this morning? See, see I, can, I, can, I can try to encourage you. People call me on the phone, I go visit folks, we pray, and we encourage each other. But if there's any peace that's going to be had, it's not because I, I know how to speak. It's because God gives peace through the presence of his Holy Spirit the paraclete, the one that comes alongside and helps, the one that leads us into all truth, the Holy Spirit that we need. He says, I'm just reading a little bit this morning, you have heard how I said unto you, I go away and I come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go to the Father for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that you might, uh, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of the world comes and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, let us go hence. And they began walking toward the place called the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples didn't know what was coming. <laughs> they didn't understand what was about to happen. But Jesus knew. And he was moving toward that garden. Every step was closer. To that, to that place where he would sweat great drops of blood, that he would be in agony. And he would, the pressure would be so great that he would just be crying out to God because he knew what was coming. Not only the physical pain and the physical death, but he knew what was coming and that for, for just a very short period of time, the sin of the world would be placed upon him, something that he had never experienced or known. The guilt of you and me and everybody that ever lived. The sin and the punishment and the judgment of all. Just imagine that. Just mine alone would have been enough. But he was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Just reading a little bit more. 
Jesus said this. Oh, this is such... You see, we need the Holy Spirit. When we, when we walk out of this building, we're facing a world out there that hates Christ. We need everything we can inside of us. Listen to what he says. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. How, how many of you grow things? You grow, how many of you grow plants? Anybody here have a garden? Garden? Now, you, you guys know I'm not a garden guy. But we have some stuff on our porch, okay? We got some of those upside-down tomato things, you know, and you put the tomatoes in there. And uh, I got this one plant, uh, this tomato plant. I'm looking at it, and the leaves got brown spots on it. I'm saying, it brown spots on my tomato plant. <laughs> So I got, I got on the internet, you know, I looked up brown spots. And they said, what do you got to do for brown spots? And it said, get rid of the plant. <laughs> I, said, I said, that's my plant. <laughs> I'm going to put it up there, put dirt in, put fertilizer. <laughs> okay. If you, if, you, if you ever had a garden or you ever grew plants, you know, you want them to what? You want them to flourish. You want them... I mean, I want to see tomatoes on that plant. In about a month or two, I want to see them, you know, tomatoes. I'm, I'm not just growing just to look at it. If you grow flowers, you like them pretty flowers because they're pretty to look at. You want the flowers, right? Jesus says, I am the vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, my father-in-law was telling me about the suckers. If you grow, again, if you grow stuff, he says, you got to pull the suckers off. I said, what's that? So whenever you get a plant, and it gets so big, and it starts shooting out, and it gets the blossoms on it, you know, down at the very bottom, they got little shoots coming out. And, and I remember seeing that one time, I said, oh, new, well, we'll get more tomatoes, man, these shoots are coming out. But them shoots, well, you find out, you can let them get this big, they ain't going to get nothing on them. <laughs> All they do is suck everything else out of the plant so it doesn't get to the... So my father-in-law, who he has a green thumb, he grows all kinds of stuff. He says, pull the suckers off. So, you know, and it's, when you look at this plant, and it's a poor little tomato plant, and it got this thing growing on it, and it's just like, I don't know if I want to pull that off. I mean, it looks like it belongs there, you know? But you just kind of get a pair of scissors and cut it off. Guess what? The tomatoes get bigger. <laughs> it works. Sometimes... If you know anything about plants, they've got to be what? They've got to be pruned. Because suckers grow. He says this. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. How many people know that in, in the body of Christ, in the church, in the congregation, sometimes suckers will grow? Don't. <laughs> now, I'm, now, listen, if I throw a brick in a pack of dogs and a dog yelps, it's, and that's the one that it hits, all right? So I'm, I'm just, I'm, all right. <laughs> okay. It says, every branch in me that bears not fruit. Do you, do you want to be a fruit bearer? You know, there's, there's folks who have been going to church for years and years and years, never led anybody to Christ. Never witnessed to one person about Jesus Christ. What's with that? Oh. I don't want to tell them. Oh, it's my, it's not my, none of their business. I'll... How are we going to bear fruit if we don't plant seeds? That's why we have up there about piling up the, the fallow ground and breaking up the fallow ground. Brother Jairus and I were talking about praying that the fallow ground will be broken up. Why? So we can plant seeds. But if you never plant a seed, listen, if you never plant a tomato seed, you're never going to get one tomato. It's not just going to happen. We were talking last week. When the Holy Spirit came upon the church, he said, I will give you power to be my... Witnesses, thank you. I will give you power to be my mouthpiece, my, my feet, my hands. It's the body of Christ. We're not going to do greater works than Jesus if we don't go out and start, start sowing some seeds somewhere. If we don't start asking for God to work through us and use us, if we just leave church and sit back and put our feet up and watch the golf game on Sunday afternoon, we're never going to see no fruit. And Jesus said, he said, that every branch of me that doesn't bear fruit, he what? Takes away. 
And every branch that bears fruit, if you are bearing fruit, you can, you can expect a little bit of purging. Because if you are bearing fruit, he's going to cut the suckers off. Because he wants the fruit to be good fruit. He wants it to be healthy. He wants it to be, you know, prosperous, a prosperous plant. He says, verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. Live. That word abide means to live in him. Not just the two or three hours out of the 168 of the week on Sunday morning. That's important. That's where we come to hear the word. That's where we come to pray for one another. That's where we come to get encouraged. That's where we come to fellowship. That's wonderful. But the purpose of this is that. Church isn't just a club you belong to. It's a place where you learn about Jesus. And a place where you allow his spirit to move and breathe inside of you. It's a place where, where you, you get tied into the vine and all that nourishment that comes from the main plant goes out to the different stems and, and, and produces fruit. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. We can't, listen, it's not up to us to get people saved. I can't save one person. It's up to me through the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness to pray that the ground is broken, to plant the seed, to pray that, and ask God to help me disciple somebody or show some, to teach them. What, what did Jesus say last week? He said, teach them. Go on all, all the world and teach them the things I've taught you. We want to go out, lead them in a prayer and go home. But the purpose is to make disciples. Just a little bit more we're going to close. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. This once, once a week church thing. If that's all it is, I've said it before, and people get mad at me for saying it. You might as well stay home. You've just come in here because, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in the church where it was my duty. Of duty. You know, we had holy days of obligation. You got to go to church. Good one. It's Sunday, going to church. Didn't want to go. No, I love to go to church. <laughs> I like church. We have a good time. But, but it's not only that. See, that was, that was like, that was a works-related thing. You have to go to church. But now I found out this, this two or three hours a week on a Sunday morning, it's what I need to get me through the other 165. Because I want to bear fruit, and I'm not going to bear fruit unless I'm abiding in him. If I leave him here on Sunday morning, I'm going to come back next week the exact same way as I left, and I'm going to leave the exact same way as I came in. If I'm doing that, I might as well just stay home and watch the tennis match. A few more verses, and we're going to close. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, in verse 4, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do what? Nothing. You can do nothing for the benefit of the kingdom of God. You can, you know, man can do a lot of things. We can... We can work up a lot of things. We can do all kinds of stuff on our own power. But it won't bring any benefit to the kingdom. One more verse and we'll close. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. See, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to leave you with this this morning. The time is coming. I've said this so many times. You probably get sick of hearing me say it. But the time is coming when now is that you're not going to be able to fake your Christianity anymore. If you're faking your Christianity, you better decide you either want to do it for real or just go ahead. 
Because the way things are going in this world, and in most of the world, and the way things are going in this nation now, it's, you're not going to be able to, to ride that fence. You might as well arm yourself with this right now. Your faith is going to be challenged. What you say you believe in is going to be challenged. It's being challenged already. It's not going to get easier. The pressure is going to be, going to be hyped up. I believe two things. I believe there's going to be a great outpouring of God's Spirit in these last days. I believe there's going to be a great persecution in these last days, before the tribulation period. And, and more and more, your faith is going to be challenged. We're going to be asked to stand or fall. It's happening right now. Do you know, I was just reading an article. They said that now when universities, when, when, uh, when a professor applies to a university for a job as a teacher, they do a background check. They check for criminal background. You know, they check their financial background. And you know what else they're checking? To see if they believe in evolution. If, if a college professor would dare, if they find out that he is a Christian and he doesn't believe in evolution, next. Huh? We, 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 we stood here uh, a few months ago when uh, this woman was here. Some of you were here. She was a missionary from Africa. She said that she had went to medical school in when uh, the, the Soviet Union in communist Russia. And before she graduated, she had to sign a paper saying that she didn't believe in God. And she didn't sign it. Because she couldn't. And she didn't graduate. Eventually she went back after the collapse of the Soviet Union and she did. They did allow her to graduate. But see, those things are coming. They're coming here. They're coming here. You better choose you this day whom you will serve. I want to tell you something. When the pressure comes, when the challenge comes, when they're going to ask you to, 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 to state what you believe, you're going to need the Holy Ghost. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. You're not going to do it in your own strength. They'll scare you in your strength. But if you've got the Holy Spirit, you know what? You'll be able to stand on God's word and no power in hell is going to be able to shake you. Because Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. See, that's what i got to stand on. That's why I want to be tied into the vine. I want to be receiving all my nourishment from Christ. I don't want to get it from the news. I don't want to get it from TV. I don't want to get it from some crazy TV preacher. I want to get it from God's Word. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's all right. I love to have people come to church. But if you're just coming here taking up space, I don't know why you're coming. I want, I, I want to see, I want to see fruit. I want to see, you know, <laughs> Rose and I prayed. Rose and I prayed. Last, last Thursday, Brother Jerry's going to be here, so it was just Rose and I here. I believe God worked that. We stood up here and we said, Lord, we prayed. We stood right here. We said, Lord, said, oh, 20, almost 21 years ago, you gave us to start this church. I'm not doing this just to have church on Sunday morning. I'm not doing this just to make a couple bucks every week. I'll find, some, I'll find some other place. I'll make more money than I make here. I want to see some fruit. I want to see some fruit. I want to see... I've got to see I want to see lives changed. I want to see lives... I want to see, I want to see crackheads delivered from drug addiction. I don't want to, I don't want to hear about 12-step programs. Some, I don't care about that. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit is able... To, to deliver alcoholics and crackheads and drug I believe he can deliver them completely. They can be a whole new creature. Do you believe that? It says here, if I ask that, he'll do it for his glory. I'm asking for that. If you want to get off that bus, go ahead. I don't want to play church. I don't want to play. I've never, I've never, been, I've never been about that. I've never been about that. We stood here and we prayed. We said, Lord... This is your church. You've called us to be here. Now, Father, show us your glory. Let your spirit be poured out. I want to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. I want a Holy Ghost-filled church. Amen. You want to be filled with, you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Huh? I praise the Lord. I do. I remember when God first filled me up with the Holy Ghost. 
I said, Lord, take me back. <laughs> take me back. You ever hear that song? Take me back, oh Lord, to the place where I first received you. Anybody remember that song? Some of us have been saved a long time. Maybe we don't remember when we first got saved. I want to go back. I want, I want that filling. If I, Lord, if you don't come to church, Holy Spirit, if you don't show up to church, you know what? I want to go find some place where you are. Amen. Because if, if he's not here, if he's not, in, if he, if he's not active in your life, I think, I think of Teresa, and I'm closing in prayer. I think of my friend Teresa, who was, she was, she was born with a mental illness. All her life, she'd been medicated, shock treatments, everything else. And those of you who knew her, she had a hard life. But all through her life, she had one hope. See, and when she would tell her psychiatrist and her doctors that she was praying, they just up her medication. But I knew what she was talking about. When I'd pick her up and we'd take a ride from Natrona down to church down to Harmonville when we were meeting down the hotel, she would say things to me that I knew had to be God because she sure couldn't think of. <laughs> she had the Holy Spirit. Everybody else thought she was crazy, but I knew she had the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. That's the only way she could say some of the stuff she was saying to me. <laughs> I'd be driving, I'd be listening to her, I'd be saying, oh, man. I want the Holy Ghost. I want a church filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. When I say this place, I don't mean this building we're in. I mean this place. I don't know what you mean, but I mean this place. This building, not made with hands. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Father, fill us with your spirit this morning. Father, every, every true believer in this room, and I know there are many, fill us with your spirit, God. God, let us be baptized in the Holy Ghost, even as they were that first day of Pentecost so many, many years ago. It said it was for their children and children's children. Father, that blessing is, is for all generations. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing. And Father, if there's anybody in this room that does not know you, if there's somebody in this room that's playing the game and they're doing the church thing, I pray, God, you would convict them. Father, that you would draw them ever closer. You expressed your love for them and for us on the cross when Jesus died there. That's the love of God. The bloody cross, the ugly Jesus hanging on the cross that was a picture of my sin. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the true message of the cross. That's why we're here. That's why we're saved. Father, I pray if there's a person in here that doesn't know you, they would, they would be convicted in their heart and they would cry out, God, I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to miss your blessing. I want to be part of that, of, those, of that vine, of the branches. I want to bear fruit. Father, my prayer is this morning as we prepare to leave this place, Father, that you would, hallelujah, God, do a work. Father, you're doing a work in somebody's heart right now. You're doing a work in somebody's heart, Father. It's a work that nobody can do. No doctor, no psychiatrist, no counselor, no medication can do. You're doing a work right now in somebody's Father, I pray, God, that you would change us. Hallelujah. And fill us with your Holy Spirit, oh God, that we might bear much fruit. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, have your way. Hallelujah. Have your way, oh God. 
You're worthy, oh Father. You're worthy. Father, I pray as we prepare to leave this place, but not your presence, Lord, that you will fill us, keep us filled, use us for your glory as we walk out of here, as we go downstairs in fellowship, Father, that your, your spirit would abide with us, Father, and we would abide with you, Father, no matter where we go. We pray for our brother and sister, uh, Anne and Rolf, as they go on their way, Father, that you would fill them, that you would use them for your glory, that, Father, that you would prepare their way, that they would glorify your name wherever they go. So there's going to be somebody that's going to need to hear their testimony. Father, anoint them and bless them. Father, for every one of us as we leave this place and go our separate ways, somebody is out there just waiting to hear what you've done for us in our lives. Anoint us to speak your word, Father, that we might bear much fruit. Break up the fallow ground. Break the hearts up. Get them ready for the seed that's going to be coming. Father, we want to see an increase in your kingdom, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, and we give you your so worthy, God. We thank you, and we give you glory in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, thou art.